presenter uh, has recently finished his uh, honours in computer engineering electrical, engineering, electrical engineering at the University of Adelaide. Um, please welcome Joel Stanley. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, my first apology is about the title there. Um, to change my slides, I have to actually regenerate the bitstream for my FPGA, so it's not easy to change my slides, so I used some previous ones. Uh, so my project uh, is titled Exploring the Communication Archite Architecture of Multiprocessor System on Chips. A bit of a mouthful. Uh, what we're all about is uh, looking at modern computer systems, which these days have, have lots of multiple processors. There's an entire uh, mini-comp stream dedicated to this topic this year. Uh, which I'd probably be almost better off being at, but uh, I've been designing rockets all afternoon, so there you go. So we're going to talk a little bit about why this project was selected, why I did it. Uh, then talk a little bit about the FPGA and the different hardware blocks I developed for that. Uh, we might even talk about what an FPGA is, just so the crowd knows what we're talking about. And then we'll talk about the different applications that I put on the FPGA. Uh, fortunately, I'm not demoing my, my project as part of my presentation, like what normally happens. Normally I play my slides, I use my legitimate Nest controller, original Nest controller to change the slides and then do a demo at the end. But unfortunately it's not working. Maybe a lightning talk later this week. So why, why do we have multi-processor multi system on ships? Why do we need lots of processors? Uh, systems are getting smaller. We're integrating more and more functionality into fewer and fewer chips. So on the left, uh, on my right, your left there, we have a Nokia from the late 90s. And this device has a, a number of ICs and very limited functionality, a, a, you know, num very small number of pixels on the screen. It essentially only makes phone calls and sends texts. Uh, whereas on the other side, we have the iPhone 4. Uh, everyone knows what that can do. It's essentially a computer in your pocket. Um, being able to not only make calls and therefore the associated digital signal processing associated with calls, but also play games, which are computationally intensive, playback video, again, computationally intensive, and also perform general purpose computing tasks. So when we're designing, designing these multi-processor system on chips, there's kind of two design strategies that the engineers take. One of them is, is ad hoc. So you, just, you buy different components from different vendors and integrate them into the one design and each time you come up with a new design, you're going to be doing that integration work uh, over and over again. The other downside is it's quite static. Once you produce this system, uh, all your different blocks can only talk together in, in a previously configured way. So you can't change your mind and later on decide, oh, we want to be able to have this innovative new functionality that involves this part talking to that part because it's quite static. The, the example up here is the OMAP 3430. If any of you own a N900, you've got this chip inside your phone. A um, number of other things uh, which don't come to mind right now. The, oh, the BeagleBoard as well. That's the other big one that uh, uses the same chip here. So the turnip design strategy is a tiled architecture. Uh, students quite familiar with the concepts of cut and paste. The engineers use the same thing. You create one processing element and you cut and paste that many times. So you're reusing your designs a lot, a lot. and the, the, the other way that it's designed, sorry, is uh, you not only have multiple things which perform the same functionality, but the interconnect between them is quite malleable. So it's just a, a memory interface in this case uh, that you can reprogram and reconfigure all these different elements however you like. And so it's not decided, decided at design time what the eventual functionality of a system will be. This process, the, this architecture here is the cell broadband engine, uh, commonly known as the PlayStation 3 uh, processor. And so this is used for obviously gaming on the PlayStation, but also for supercomputing uh, function, um, applications as well. And that kind of shows how you can get into different things, not necessarily what it was designed for uh, after the fact, unlike the, uh, the other architecture that I showed, talked about just before. So my project. Um, the project, uh, just when I keep referring to my project, I'm talking about the final year project that you have to do at the end of your engineering degree. So it's a year-long project, usually as a, as a part of a team. My, I and did mine by myself, essentially. Um, and so at the start, we decided, OK, it's a good idea to understand the hardware we're working with. That's this board I've got at the front here. And so it was at the time, it was at the start of last year, it was a, a brand new, fresh from the factory, you know, only a couple of hundred around the world system. Uh, and essentially, we were debugging it. You buy it for cheap, 
because the software doesn't quite work quite yet and there's not many applications for it. And so things like getting it to talk to a PC through the USB interface, there was no firmware for the USB controller, so we had to write that before we could then talk to the PC and be able to put our data on there, et cetera, et cetera. So understand the hardware, understand what it can do, what its limitations are, that was the first goal. The second goal was to implement a simple multiprocessor communication application. So it's the kind of thing that you learn a bit about if you've done operating systems, uni. I hadn't done operating systems at the time, so I, I learned about that. Learned about what are the kind of uh, communication paradigms people use for talking between two processes. Uh, the same things apply generally to two um, processes on, on running on an operating system, but in this case it was two processes running on separate CPUs. And finally, I developed a, a killer application, something fancy to show off at conferences like this when the hardware actually works. So as I said, this is the board. And on the board, uh, so rewinding a, a tiny bit, who knows what an FPGA is? Okay, so about half. So an FPGA, at its simplest form, is a processor that can be programmed to act like another processor. Uh, it's quite a bit more complex than that, but that's just, and that, will, uh, that will get you through this talk, essentially. So you, uh, you create designs using an IDE, essentially, and then download them to the processor, and it will then act like essentially any other processor you want, the limitations being clock speed and the number of logic, programmable logic elements that are on there. This particular board, has, or the, the processor inside it, has been used to uh, emulate the entire Intel Atom, the first generation Intel Atom, so that gives, and that used up almost all the logic elements. So that gives you a, some perspective on, on how complex the designs can get, quite complex. Um, but in my application, I used a processor called, a core called Microblaze, so this is a, a risk-like architecture. Um, if anyone studied Hennessy and Patterson, it's similar to the DLX machine. And uh, quite simple, it doesn't have much grunt, much less grunt than the simplest netbook you could buy these days. But uh, there are some ways to, to get around that, and that's essentially what my project was about. It wasn't about powerful processes, it was about optimizing the communication and making the communication efficient between the different processes. And then there are a bunch of other parts that make up the FPGA. There's different kinds of memories. There's the, the DDR3, the off-chip memory that you have in your laptop, and then there's onboard memories. And the differences between these two are essentially latency. How, much, how long does it take to go and fetch something or put something in that memory? And ideally, you'd have unlimited amounts of onboard RAM, and so everything would be really, really fast. The problem is then your chips would be infinite in size. They consume infinite amounts of power and put out infinite amounts of heat. And so that's not going to happen. So you have to make a trade-off. Where are you going to put the, the data that's most important to you? And where are you going to put the data that you access a little bit less frequently? And deciding which data is, falls into which category is, is one of the problems that, is, that multi-core computing has to solve. And so these different memories have different types of, of buses that connect them, that have different properties. I won't go into that now, but uh, the different buses uh, result in different kinds of latency. Some of them are shared, and so if you're doing lots of different traffic across them, it's going to increase the latency. Some other ones are dedicated, so much lower latency. So I've spoken a bit about memory latency. For a few, uh, I've mentioned a few times already. That was the first part of the project, understanding how slow the different pro memories were and the different buses that connect them. The problem with this is the, way to the only way to record it is from inside the FPGA itself. And uh, so you might sit there and, and talk to a memory map timer and say, start recording now but that has to go across the bus that you're trying to measure the performance of. So you don't really know when that start now command is going to get there. And so that's the kind of the, the hazy line here between start and end time. And so the first part of the project was you know, reading uh, assembly dumps and working out exactly what the latencies were and producing lots of graphs like this for, for putting in reports. So this shows the, the order of magnitude of the different memory latencies. And as you can see, some of the the latencies move up and down. They're the shared buses that I talked about just before. So when the, uh, the display controller is sitting there copying the frame buffer to be displayed on the screen, the latency is much higher because there's much more contention on the bus. And then other points in the, the blanky interval, if you know anything about how VGA works, um, there's, not, there's no traffic. You're not clocking out anything, and so the, the latency reduces a fair bit. Uh, and these are the kind of challenges that your application has to contend with uh, if there's lots of, lots of things going on at once. So the, the first demo trivial application I put in there was a JPEG decoder. So this is the, the JPEG pipeline. There's essentially five stages. 
uh, we won't go into them today, but they, they all perform varying uh, signal processing tasks and, and kind of compression tasks and whatnot. And um, it's a good application for multi-core programming because it can be split up both uh, different stages running on different processes, but you can also split up an image. So have, say, one processor will decode one quadrant of the image and you can split it across four processes that way. So this is the first system I built. The two big squares, processors, with each with their own local memories, a shared bus, pushing out JPEGs, images, to a display controller. And you debug it all through a serial port, the UART there. And so looking at JPEG decoding, uh, the first iteration to decode a full screen image was about 3 million cycles, 300, 300 million cycles. And the first optimization I performed was instead of having to go and fetch that source image from DDR each time, was to stream it in via the USB link. And as you can see, this doubled the speed. So this is one of the challenges in multi-core programming and, and meant systems that have um, non-uniform memory architectures. Some of the memories are going to be a lot slower than others. So if you can get the data closer to the consumer, your system is going to go much faster. And so that brought me up to about halfway through my project. Um, it was essentially meet, met all the academic goals. So I decided to do something a little bit more fun. This is the, the multi-core Game Boy emulator. So we took GNGB, it's an open source Game Boy emulator, app get install GNGB. Uh, you can run it on your laptop now. And uh, this emulates the, the Game Boy Color hardware. And so the Game Boy Color is a, an overclocked Game Boy, it's running twice as fast, 8 megahertz Z80 essentially, with uh, some dedicated sound hardware, very, very small frame buffer, limited number of colors on the screen at once. And so we took the 15,000 lines of code and threw most of it out. Lots of um, abstractions and whatnot for running on different platforms, things, code we didn't need. Um, and, and essentially kind of, yeah, talking to libraries like SDL, whereas on this system we're running without an operating system, straight on a processor. And when you're talking to, say, the frame buffer, you're writing pixels directly to a memory region. When you're reading from the button input, you're reading from a register. So you don't need all these abstractions that SDL provides. And so the system I used has an input device, being the Nest controller, uh, some sound output, which we developed because it wasn't on the board, a frame buffer, and four processes, as the title of my talk mentions. So the Game Boy system started off with a single tile, so a single processor with some local memory. Uh, these local memories are in the order of about 128 kilobytes each, so quite small compared to our, I mean, that's how much cache that your uh, crappy little Intel um, Atom processor has these days, so not much memory at all. And I cut and pasted. So tiled architecture, four processors, each with a dedicated functionality in this case, and then glued together across that big shared bus that I spoke to about before. So. Initially, the bootloader loads the ROM image from the, mark, the um, compact flashcard into memory. It then sits, kicks off the Game Boy instruction set simulator. And um, that's initially what the system was. We get about 10% performance using a system like that. Nowhere near playable, not much fun to play at all. And so we split off the uh, sound processing to another processor inside the, the Game Boy itself. That's just a register write, the interface between the sound core and the process and the the instruction decoding, so it's very easy to, to split across two processes because you've got that well-defined interface. Uh, the other bit of optimization we did was moving out the um, video processing partially to a, a color space converter, a bit of VHDL, to shuffle the pixels around a little bit, and then a video DMA core, essentially all that does is just copy the pixels in and push them out to the display so that the instruction set simulator can continue doing the, the work of playing the game. And so this is what the inside of the FPGA looks like with that design on there. Each of the different colored blobs is one of those uh, kind of tiles I showed you just before. So it shows you how little of the thing we're using even for a four core system. And so now is about when I usually press the start button and show the Game Boy demo. Unfortunately, I can't do that because I couldn't get the FPGA working. But hopefully I'll get it working later this week and, and show you later on. Um, so this is what I, I did plan to do this summer. Didn't do any of this stuff. Decided to find a job instead. Um, but there, there's some tasks that people are going to pick up on next year uh, as they continue the project at LA Uni. Any questions? No one more thing. There are 
Yeah, maybe I'll get it working then. Um, I did a um, FPGA course last semester, or yeah, last semester in as well, and we did a bit of um, handle C and VHDL programming. So I'm quite interested in how you actually went about coding and what tools you use, because it sounds like there wasn't actually much available. And we were using the um, some of the exciting tools that actually provided for you, so we didn't have to deal with any of the actual underlying hardware stuff. Mm. So could you talk about that for a bit? That would be quite yeah, nice. Yes. So um, I'll just bring up my slides again. Hmm. There we go. Uh, uh, this one. So, um, so most of the IP initially was just the stuff that Xilinx provides, you know, with XPS, the stuff you would have used. So that's the, the processes, the large, tire, large squares. Um, and then the first step when things weren't going fast enough was to customize the hardware that they gave us. So one of the first things I wanted to do was uh, increase the, the resolution of the display controller that it comes with. It only does 800 by 6 something and doesn't look very good, right? And also there's not much that's a, a fairly small amount of memory. You can essentially uh, double the amount of copies you have to do by, double, by going up to the next VGA resolution to XGA. And so that's the first hack I did, was change the, the it was a Verilog um, module to, to do twice the resolution. And so if I was showing on my board, you'd say how nice it looked. So that, that was the, the next step, right? Customizing the card where they gave you. Then the next step after that was, um, if the hardware was too hard to customize, or if it wasn't you know, performing the functionality we required, I'd write it from scratch. And so that was things like the color space converter, the uh, NES controller input, that's just a state machine that deserializes the NES buttons, um, and the I2S generator we actually got from the net. It's a nice bit of uh, hardware open sourciness. There's not much of that in the, in the hardware space, so it was good to see that. Yeah, so um, the, the writing VHDL, if you haven't done any HDL or any um, any of that kind of programming is tricky, uh, as you would have discovered. But you know we got there in the end. I didn't use handle C, so I'd be interested to see how you found that. Yeah. My supervisor didn't have very high opinions of it. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. I, it, it sounds like it's basically dead, and people are kind of switching over to System C now. So sure. that's that's what I've heard. Yeah. Um, just just if you're interested, we we wrote a. Um, Desk core. Um, the idea was you can have multiple, uh, like we had one of these Spartan starter kits, starter boards with, that come with a VGA output and sound output and all that kind of stuff. And we essentially, the idea was to, to um, connect two of them together. One is encrypting, one is decrypting, a VGA output and all that kind of stuff written by hand, essentially, yep. not using any of the predefined cores. So it was an interesting project. Oh, cool. We'll talk about it later. That sounds good. I've got a video of my, uh, if I can light up YouTube. Any other questions while that loads up? Actually, I have a question. Mm -hmm. The you you sort of talked about splitting out, uh, and I mean I'm I'm not a sort of low level hardware person, so I, I may not entirely know what I'm talking about, but you split out the the video processing, the audio processing and so forth. Uh, did you look at all or consider perhaps trying to uh, parallelize, say, the video processing so that you could have, you know, a couple of, I suppose, smaller cores actually processing different parts of the video to actually uh, make more use of the, the available resources? Sure. So, I mean, that's one of the objectives when you're trying to parallelize something across model processes. In this case, the video CPU itself, all it was doing was taking in data from a register read and pushing it out to the frame buffer. So it was just a, a very overcomplicated over DMA. Um, okay. If there was some paraly paralyzation there, we would have tried it. And, but essentially the, the division that you saw up on the board, the three different cores, uh, were the only obvious ones in, in this application. It doesn't really map very well. Like the JPEG maps really well to lots of cores. You can split those five different blocks across. Yeah, you can split it across five different blocks, and then you can do different parts of the image. But in this case, it's kind of designed to run as one, run as one program. I'll just show you this video briefly. This is my supervisor playing Mario on a projector. This is the first time we saw it working. It was kind of exciting. Uh, I I hope it stays on that monitor. Oh, it does. There you go. It's very shaky. It's taken with my G1. How 
How does YouTube work? Why can't I rewind it? <laughs> so it gives you a bit of an idea what it looks like. It look, you know, we, um, we decode the JPEG uh, when you first boot up. Essentially, the bootloader decodes that, so it's just a picture sitting on the screen, and then you draw the, the Game Boy in the middle. And it operates at the demo I was going to show you, about 90%. Uh, it's really interesting the way uh, humans perceive video versus sound. When you're perceiving video, if the frame rate drops a tiny bit, you generally don't notice. But if, the, if you miss a sound sample out to the ADC, you'll hear a click straight away. And so that's why I had one that went at 90%, because you, especially in our more complex scenes, you hear the clicking as you aren't producing sound samples often enough. It's actually a, another hardware module which is in this design which illuminates the LEDs as you miss sound samples. And so you see the counter go higher and higher as the system performs worse. Okay, thank you very much, Joel. Thanks, everyone.